Hi, my name is Dunk. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm Divi. I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. And this is our podcast, Spirits Rising, where we question everything we've been taught about faith. Listen to our unfiltered discussions with awesome guests as we explore liberating spiritualities true to our experiences. So if you've listened to past episodes, you'll notice that someone's missing. Esther, where is she? Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, as, oh, no. Well, Esther's moving up on in life. She has a great new job. And Dunk is her replacement, taken over. Um, and I'm really excited about this. And I'm really excited to have this talk and... We're essentially just going to be getting to know each other because me and Dunk have been working together for a bit, but we haven't had like a, I don't think we've had like a good get to know you conversation. Do you think we have? I don't know. Not really. I think that's maybe the, um, the, the, one of the pitfalls of, you know, starting new jobs in, in COVID times because you don't really get to like yeah. hang out by the water cooler or whatever. You kind of just only have Zoom meetings. I know no like lunchtime chats and all that yeah um yeah so this episode we're going to be able to ask each other questions and we're going to get to know each other a bit more and my first question for you is very very important is very very serious okay are you ready for this 100 percent. okay so you have a dog correct <laughs> uh mm -hmm. yes i have a dog i have a dog and his name <laughs> is zuko uh, fans of Avatar The Last Airbender will very much recognize that name for a reason. Fans of Danny Zuko, I'm sorry to disappoint. I didn't know that was a person. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, Zuko, he's six months now. And uh, yeah, six months actually, what, just tomorrow. Six months officially tomorrow because his birthday is February 14th, Valentine's Day. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's a little Valentine's baby. Um, yeah, he's six months, uh, Bulboro Mastiff boxer mix. So he's going to be a big boy. He's already, uh, 45 pounds and, um, yeah, he's, he's just the cutest little boy. And my partner has, uh, a Mastiff, uh, King Corso boxer mix, uh, Robin, who's about two years old. And uh, they're absolutely smitten with each other. Zuko is like absolutely just Aww. in love with his big sister. Aww. How are okay? My, the real question is: How are you awake right now with a six-month-old puppy and work and doing all the things that Dunk has to do in their day-to-day -day life? <laughs> like, I don't have a puppy. I've never had a dog, but I dog sit, and for the like one week or few days that I do, I feel like my energy is completely zapped. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, well, I mean, um, the, 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 the secret is probably uh, prescription amphetamines, <laughs> um, which I get because I have ADHD, because <laughs> um, that already just eliminates chance of sleep most nights anyway, But because uh, they're like long-lasting 13, 14-hour um, stimulant medications <laughs> for, for this, this thing that my brain does. So um, sleep isn't, isn't much of a thing mostly but honestly like i mean it was it was hell uh during crate training like at the beginning of it uh with zuko but um you know we we worked on it and we worked really hard uh and we like had a lot of not so sleepful nights and now you know he sleeps in the in in the crate uh most nights but not every night now because he's gotten a lot better and he spends certain time like meal times in his crate and he he loves it in there now it's it's become his little like sanctuary his own little bedroom if he wants like alone time which thankfully enough unlike most dogs he actually enjoys alone time um yeah so that's, that's nice. nice yeah robin not not as much robin robin sleeps in the bed with us and we'll never go in a crate <laughs> so what you're saying is i need to get me some of those pills to continue to do my yeah yeah to continue i mean my dogs <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's uh <laughs> It's a pretty I'm common trope already. for for university students, I have to say. But I am admitting to crime or intent to commit crimes on this podcast. Um, 
Okay. Another question relate kind of related to your dog, but more so related to your dog's name. Have you watched Legend of Korra? Uh yeah, I've I've watched Legend of Korra multiple times. I I really really enjoy Legend of Korra. Um, hey. Yeah, like I wouldn't say in the same way of of the way that I enjoy The Last Airbender, but I think that's just because they're very different narratives. Yeah, they're like, different. Not one is better than the other, but rather it's just they're different which I enjoy. For those of you who are listening, which is everybody, because this is not a video, this is a podcast, I'm about to hold something up. And it's a book. The Legend of Korra. Turf Wars, part one. And oh, cool. I love, I love this book. And it's great. I, I was really excited when I got to the end of Legend of Korra. And then I think it's like Korra and Asami like hold hands or something. And you're like, oh! <gasps> Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was, um, yeah, the, the show developers, uh, talked about that when it came out afterwards because it was run by Nickelodeon and, um, yeah, yeah that was, that was the, o- that, that was, that was all they were allowed to do. They wanted it to be a kiss. They wanted it to have like a romantic and, you know, same as the last airbender with, uh, Aang and Katara, but mm mm Nickelodeon was like, no, we can't have two. They're they're just friends. Shake my head. No, they didn't get the epic love story that Aang got. Um, but yeah, I really like this book. And there's like a part in it where um, Asami and Korra like tell Korra's parents that they're together. And then her parents are like, wow, we weren't expecting that. But we're really happy for you guys. I don't know when I read that. I don't know yeah. why. I was like, oh my gosh, this is everything. Um, yeah oh my goodness yeah. it gets so much better like in some of the other ones like uh, they get to talk to um, Kaya who's uh, one of the children of, of Avatar Aang and uh, turns out that she is uh, a lesbian uh, however Asami and Korra are both bi um, rep mm-hmm. the bi flag for those mm-hmm. listening at home I'm pointing to mine in, in my on my wall <laughs> but um yeah, like uh, she talks about the fact that the air nomads uh, had no concept of sexuality um, in a rigid sense. They only had like fluid sexualities. There was no judgment, and even gender was like very not cared about. Um, it was just people got to love who they wanted to love and present how they wanted to present, and it was. Um, yeah, a lot more open. And apparently the uh, fascism of the Fire Nation when the Hundred Years War started, they really wanted to promote family structures because fascism, but also like bodies for the Imperial Army. So that's mm. when homophobia kicked in in this world. And yeah. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yup. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to talk so much about Avatar. I feel like but we could Sorry, honestly I, I this absolutely love avatar i mean i've i've got an air nomad tattoo for a reason i'm i'm about to like next paycheck i get i might be dropping like 200 bucks on the new uh avatar like tabletop role playing game that came that, that's like coming out on kickstarter it's like fully licensed Whoa. and everything yeah speaking of games transition wow aren't i a great podcast host listen to these transitions incredible <laughs> incredible so you play D D, correct uh yeah i do i i play D D on my other podcast folks and fables i feel like growing up i i knew no one who actually played D. i'd only like see it on tv and i think like there's a very specific like picture painted of like all these like people in a basement and they're like playing away and they're usually like these nerdy people and I was like what is this thing they're playing it looks so cool because you just get so like absorbed into it um and I think Peter the last gen secretary for SEM also plays d and um and I've been saying we need like an SEM d and thing because I don't know what I don't know what it is I don't know how it works but I want to play it so badly I think they have it on um commu- that show community I don't know if you know the show community yeah I'm actually show. currently uh watching that with my partner Kelsey um because she's never finished it so Ooh. yeah it's it's really good it's um they have a couple of D episodes they play a very like old version of D, which is weird they also do it in a very like strange way um I actually got a little upset like one time because it's just like what was it they 
Oh, no, it's weird. It's like the only person that's ever rolling dice is um, the DM, mm-hmm. which I feel which doesn't happen. Like players are supposed to roll their own dice, um, which I can get into in a bit later. But um, yeah, and I, I I just feel like the fun is taken away if the players don't get to like roll the shiny math rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Do you feel like if someone gets into D and D, it's like a thing? It feels very culty. Like once you're in it, like it's part of your identity and you can't escape. <laughs> like, is that going to happen to me if I get into it? Okay. I'm very suddenly aware of the fact that I do have like a and d shirt on right now, but, um, Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, it's just a very comfy shirt though. Uh, and pink. So that's nice. But, um, honestly, no, I mean like it's, it's, it's just a fun game that you can play with your friends really. And it's a, a great creative storytelling method as well um because the way it effectively works is you have a storyteller who like sets up the world and like plays all the not important characters and then the main characters are all played by the players hence the name player um and so basically the players get to choose what they want to do and they get to choose like how they do it and they get to make their own characters and customize it's very much um like uh most you know rpg video games you know you have a you get to build a character, you get to customize like their skills and stuff. So you can have like a mage or you can have like a healer or like an archer or like a thief or like a warrior or like a bard. And there's like all these different ways of like experiencing the world and having all these different skills and magic and not magic and all that stuff. Um, and the idea What's is that a like... bard? <laughs> Sorry? What's a bard? Um, a bard is someone who can uh, weave magic through music, um, and yeah, they like they're like very charismatic and stuff. And like bards are like entertainers, singers, songwriters. So it's about like creative expression and like the creative expression creating magic. I actually play a bard on Folks and Fables, um, but they're also like druids, which are people who get like nature magic, and then there are clerics who get magic from like a divine god. Um, you know, all, all, all these different sorts of things like wizards who, you know, have to learn and, you know, study academics to gain magic knowledge and sorcerers are just born with innate magic abilities. That's so cool. I'm starting to realize, though, one reason why I might not have played D&D at all is the same reason why I was forced to delete League of Legends off my computer as a child, which is, like, strict Pentecostal. <laughs> like, any side of magic is wrong. Uh, yeah, fair enough. That would, yeah, that would <laughs> very much be D&D would stand it. for demons and demons. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, D&D D- D- has definitely had its experience in the media depicted uh, as devil worship. Whoa, that's wild. Yeah, well, um, like crazy, crazy Christian mothers in the seventies and eighties didn't like the idea of being. That's my D&D. mom. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Shout out to my mom. I love my mom. Um, and speaking of weird childhoods, <laughs> did you grow up in a Christian environment, or like, what was your experience with religion growing up? Uh, yeah. So, um. Half my family is Christian, uh, been part of the United Church since the United Church was a thing. Um, actually, one of the, like, at, at the time of the, the formation of the United Church of Canada, um, back in whenever it was, um, one of my great, great grandmothers was, like, part of their congregation's um discussions to to affiliate themselves with the united church of canada instead of i think it was like presbyterian or methodist um so yeah we're like very hard into the paint for the united church uh but then the other side of my family uh my mom's side of the family is uh muslim uh we're muslim Guyanese. so uh my parents decided that what would probably be best is just to raise my brother and i uh with both so you know, I did like masjid on, on Fridays and Sunday worship on Sundays. And yeah, it was, it was a fun, I mean, really it, it just shot my weekends to hell, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've been like very exposed to religion of all sorts uh, throughout my childhood. Uh, most of my friends growing up were um, Hindu in Brampton and then 
when I moved to Toronto, we moved to a very um, like Jewish neighborhood. So all of my friends growing up uh, were also like Jewish. So yeah, I just had a whole lot of, uh, I guess, experience with religion growing up. Mm -hmm. Would you say, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about the United Church, except for the fact that like SEM works so much with them now. Um, and I don't know a lot about the United Church, what it might have been like when we were children i don't know if it's been different but did you find that they were like super progressive in their teachings or was was there also those like undertones of like um honestly bigotry is the word that comes to mind just because yeah. of my experience um, but yeah. yeah yeah for sure uh definitely i think like there have been like congregants who ha are are more like closed-minded uh or or bigoted um yeah you, you'll very often encounter people like that depending on where you are like in the congregation itself however the institution and and the the religious leaders and the people on the board are from my experience have never been like that i mean we've celebrated pride month uh when i was a kid and we um talked about the fact that some people think that homosexuality is not allowed because of the bible but truth is that's not what the bible says right and we accept everyone um you know there were sermons that i've heard about that and um you know we were in a very like i i don't know i guess ethnically mixed congregation um you know there wasn't and there like it wasn't even dominatingly white surprisingly enough like when i was like a, a little kid back when we were living in brampton but um you know, uh, definitely when we moved to Toronto, I started going to Willowdale United, which is now Willowdale Emanuel United. And when it was Willowdale United and I, when I was working there then, it was predominantly white. And there was some times where people would be like, oh, like, oh, where are you from? And like, oh, that must have been like, you know, so hard or whatever, or whatever. I don't know. And some people would be like, oh, well, like, what is your native language or whatever? Like, oh, like you speak so such good English. And it's like, well, Guyana is a british colony and i was born here in canada so yes i speak good english um yeah it's like little things like that but it's like very much i don't know i guess it's just like older like white liberal people like they don't realize the like the diet racism that they that they have yeah i hear that um and you're either you are now or you're like going into emmanuel college right uh, yeah, I'm entering my second year uh, at Emmanuel College, and uh, yeah, I finished my first year. Uh, yeah, I finished my first year and was able to do studies in both uh, like Christian theology, but also uh, in Islamic studies under Dr. Nevin Retta. Emmanuel College also has some incredible uh, Muslim scholars as well, uh, and there, there's a huge multi-faith program there uh there's a lot of uh, buddhist scholars and uh members of like the baha'i faith and indigenous scholars as well oh that's really cool i didn't know any of that because yeah i don't know i've never looked into emmanuel college before like i think just based off like who i know goes there i think i assumed it was like um seminary like mostly, mostly for christians or like um the kind of school you go to to become a pastor and that would essentially like be all that is but i'm starting to learn more and more um how honestly really cool emmanuel college is like i have one professor from ryerson um chris eichmann and i think he also teaches at emmanuel college and he's really cool yeah he's um, he was my new testament prof <gasps> he was my new testament prof well he kind of he he said he kind of taught new testament stuff but i think the course was called intro to christianity for ryerson um, and he wrote like a book called New Testament and something, something. And we read that. Um, that's cool. Yeah. He kind of like for everyone in my program, he kind of just like ruined the New Testament for us because like now we're just like constantly yeah. <laughs> looking at like the validity of like the epistles and stuff. Like whenever we're, we have to preach on anything, it's yeah. That's so cool. You know, actually, Chris Eichmann's the reason why I work with SEM. <laughs> oh, really? Like, he, yeah yeah he's the one who got me well not didn't get me the job but he's he like emailed me and he was like hey SEM's hiring for campus coordinators so i was like what's the SEM?" and then i applied and now i'm the general secretary 
So I owe my entire career thus far to Chris Zeichman. Shout out Chris Zeichman. <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, I remember um, he um he like I, I was early to a Zoom class and he saw my D and D poster um like on the wall beside me. And he immediately was just like, Whoa, I play D D too. And we just had to have a conversation. Whoa! Yeah, it was yeah. Look, another person for an SCM D and D group, Chris Zeichman. <laughs> I feel like if uh, we did uh if we did a SEM uh D and D group, everyone would want to be either a cleric or a paladin just to like show that I I guess just to work through religious trauma. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's my oh my only gosh. fear with I don't an know. SEM D and D group. Oh my gosh. When you said when you were just talking about bards though, those sounded really cool. Uh, bards are so cool. That's I have... that, that is the only class you're allowed to play if you're bisexual <laughs> oh my gosh i'm fitting into stereotypes and i didn't even i wasn't even aware of it um so i have one more question for you um so i'm curious about what i mean maybe there's not just one thing but um when you think about why you want to get into ministry I and mean, correct me if i'm wrong but i think you told me before that you were looking into becoming a pastor yourself and then of course you're going to emmanuel college now but what kind of like led you onto that path yeah i'm training to be a minister with the united church of canada uh and what really brought me onto that path was working for willowdale emmanuel united and working under specifically Sarah Chapman. And the work that I did there uh, in the summer positions, we had a community garden. And so we were the grow staff and we would, uh, you know, take care of the community garden and we would also help out with worship and we would also uh, do any like other special projects that came up or help around the church for like different projects. And we had a lot of freedom as well to like, create our own sort of projects and, and fundraising ideas and so um we did a lot of different things and that also involved going to the go project uh in toronto uh except one year we actually did go to vancouver which was really awesome but uh the go project is is a, I f a united church affiliated uh mission project where we do a lot of volunteering um and community-based work so a lot of it was going to uh meal programs for the homeless or like safe injection sites or like clothing donation drives and like helping sort and stuff like that going to shelters and helping clean um you know that kind of stuff and it was really amazing work that we did and it was all because of the church organizations that we were we were working with and and were inspiring and setting these things up for us and everything and you know the perspective that i was able to gain from that and the help that i was able to provide and the good that i was able to do it just um it just clicked and i i just kind of like felt i don't know i i, I guess weirdly enough i i i felt the presence of god in that work and um you know, I, I had never really felt that before. And so I started following that idea and I started getting more involved with the church and helping out more and, and learning more. And, uh, you know, before then I was helping out with the uh, audio tech stuff uh, for Sunday worship and everything, um, being the only person there other than the minister who is like not a thousand years old. It was kind of a necessity for, for me and my coworkers to do that. But yeah, it was just an incredible experience, um, and it gave me, like, just the support that I needed, and looking at what that gave me and what that did for my mental health and, and what that did, you know, for my own growth and development and realizing that I could do these programs for for others in the future and that I could be participating in that and that I could be, you know, serving a community and serving God and working for an institution that wasn't profit driven. Um, it, it just seems too good to be real, but I'm working towards making it real. So, yeah. I love that. Um, and it's really cool to hear your story and what led you to that, because I think it's, 
again, like, I don't know, bring it back to my upbringing. It's so rare um, to have these types of conversations. Our church was super small, and I think most of, like, the youth were um, not that interested in church or participating in church. And honestly, for a fairly good reason, based off, like, how um, my church experience was growing up. But um, to hear you talk about how, like, you you were able to actually, like, volunteer and serve the community, do community work, do work that wasn't profit-driven, and in that, you experiencing the presence of God is, like, so cool and so beautiful. Yeah, and I mean, like, even on top of that, we got to focus on bigger things, too, like, you know, food justice and environmental sustainability. Those are really big, important aspects for the United Church, and the idea that we are meant to be stewards uh, to the earth, not ne necessarily have dominion over the earth, like uh, the Catholic interpretation and such. So, I don't know, to me that that was really important. Just finding uh, an organization and, and that I support in pretty much every regard, it, it's, it's hard to find something like that and to actually have the ability to provide something worthwhile to them and to be employed for that that's it's just yeah it, it would it's it's amazing i hear that like when i started getting paid for scm stuff and like the first time I, d I did a sermon and got paid for that i was like wait you can survive you can make a living doing this type of stuff because um in the church i grew up in like it was all volunteer right like i was doing everything i was super committed to church um and I was doing so many things as all volunteer for like years and years and years. Most of my life I've been doing that. And then as you start getting paid to like help people and be in community and and just have like meaningful conversations, it's just so cool. Like you said, it feels too good to be true sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I mean, like as soon as you get that MDiv like and, and you're ordained, like you're you, you get the title of reverend, which is like a gender neutral uh, prefix, mm. unlike Mr. or Mrs., so mm. it's pretty dope in my opinion. I don't know. Oh, I've never thought about that before. That is pretty cool. That's like half my encouragement to work towards a PhD. <laughs> Dude, I think about that too. Like I hear, well, I go back and forth because I hear about my friends who are just in their masters and they complain so much and like, oh my God, it's so much of this, so much of that. They make it sound like death and I'm like, maybe I should never go back to school. But then like, I don't know, just having that doctor in your name and having those experiences just, I don't know, sometimes I think about it kind of alluring. Yeah, well, I mean, my parents named me Duncan Ronald uh, with the intention of, of having that DR, right? Like they, they set me up for, for the expectations, I'm, I'm sure. But I mean, also like, I don't know, just for myself, uh, I mean, yeah, school is school is death, but so would work be. So I don't know, uh, it seems like Ooh, the, the better yeah. of the two. And, you know, living in capitalism where we have to pay for school, uh, student debt is a big thing. But as long as you're in school, you don't have to pay back said student debt. So yeah. I'll just stay in school forever. It's a problem for future dunk. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or or if we just keep doing school until future dunk is dead, then no more student it's debt. It's a problem for nobody. <laughs> exactly. Who who gets to pay back the debt? No one. Zuko inherits the debt. And Zuko has to pay it all <laughs> off. Oh man. Oh, he would have to drive truck. He's got no brains. Yeah, he's got I don't know, he got to contribute somehow. Maybe he can work in, like, a bowling alley. Yeah, that would be perfect, as long as he doesn't chew the shoes. <laughs> All right, I'm ready for my questions. Give me some questions. All righty. So, I guess, uh, <laughs> firstly, I'd like to ask, um, how long have you been working with the student Christian movement? Not long at all. Um, I've been gen secretary for, like, I want to say five months. And before this, I worked as the Ryerson campus coordinator for just one school year. Um, and before that, I had never heard of SCM before in my life. Um, so less than two years. Wow, that's incredible. And I'm already at the quote unquote top. Yeah. Even though SCM is pretty horizontal, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that still shows great signs of upwards mobility uh, for careers. So if anyone is interested in applying for SCM, do it today. Yes, please do it. <laughs> we need more people. <laughs> 
Oh no, wait, that sounded too desperate. I mean, if you want, it's whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, like we might call you it's back. It's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll get an interview maybe. <laughs> so, what's been your relationship with religion before and after joining SEM, especially given the little tidbits that Ooh. you've peppered into the rest of the episode? Oh. Oh, so much I could say. I'm going to try not to say too much. Um but sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> of course. What's been your relationship with religion before and after joining SEM? Oh, okay. Well, um, I would say that SEM has offered... Okay, before I say that, I think a big part of religion is community. A big part of anything is community. The people you surround yourself with with you eventually become a little bit more like them in a way or at least you start learning things from them um and the community i was in prior to scm um was a christian community that i definitely didn't feel was (sighs) i definitely didn't feel the presence of god at certain times um it felt very toxic it felt very damaging i got to a point where My mental health was so bad that every time I would go to church, I physically couldn't stand. Like, it was affecting my physical body. Um, How much I... How much, like, that church was super toxic. But at the same time, it's super nuanced. Like, at the same time, that church is my family. Um, And sometimes, even to this day, I think about going back and visiting them, even though they 100% would not... um, call me by the name that I want to be called or call me by the pronoun, like these are my pronouns. They wouldn't do any of that. And yet there's still a part of me that's like, Oh, but I miss them. Um, so I think a huge, um, aspect of religion is community and my relationship to that community is very similar to what my relationship with religion is. Um, yeah, I think it's very nuanced. It's not very black and white, but I think that while I was growing up in that church, I did feel the presence of God when it came to aspects of church, like, um, worship and um when i would read the bible the things i would read gave me a lot of peace and it helped me to kind of develop what i think was like natural empathetic um character that i have it kind of just like confirmed like oh yes we should love people we should take care of the earth we should do like all these good things um And then I was feeling really limited and bottled up because I felt like there wasn't a space for me to express and do the good works that I felt like I was called to do. Um, And now that I'm in SEM, it feels so fulfilling because I can do that stuff. Like I can put into action what I feel like Jesus has called um, me and called Christians to do. And I feel like my perspective on what Christianity is and what my relationship with God is is so different now. Um, but at the same time, I do feel like that seed was planted in me when I was a kid and very young. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question. I feel like I was just like rambling, but those no, are the words that came does. to my mind. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the great things about something like a student Christian movement, right? Like it's, it, it provides a platform for youth to actually be involved and work out their religious ideals and and how they want to enact those religious ideals out into the world i think that's yeah it gives us a sense of power yeah it's it's almost like um it's actually evangelical in the sense but like the original like meaning of evangelical not like the 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 current meaning of evangelical um break it down for us dunk what does it mean oh basically it kind of originally yeah it kind of originally means like basically people um enacting theology through improvement in the world effectively i i I feel Mm -hmm. like i'm kind of butchering this a little bit but i'm trying to simplify it but basically what it means is like if if you think that god is telling you to do certain things and you're working towards heaven then working towards heaven and and working towards uh, like better life is it starts on earth and so you have to make the world a better place right you want to make heaven on earth so yeah yeah, just enacting what you think is, like, your theology into the world, like, actively doing it, right? Actively living through Christ. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, if 
I, I think the United Church is very evangelical in, in some of its regards. Like, they used to have a lot of money tied into, um, like, the fossil fuel industry and, like, fossil fuel investments. And then uh, we actually divested all of our um, profits from fossil fuels and everything uh, into, like, more renewable resources and such. Um, so, you know, us doing that, I mean, that actually caused, like, a, a bit of an economic turn for oil in Canada. Um, raising certain prices and such and, and making the industry a little bit more difficult because we divested our money. Um, but hurting the oil industry and then promoting renewable energy and resources with that money, like that is making the world a better place, right? Like that is actively mm-hmm. fighting climate change in order to serve God, right? It's it's because of the theology we do this. And that's, that's kind yeah. of what the original meaning is. I love that. I think there's a lot of um okay another thing why i like say things are nuanced is i feel like a lot of people not to excuse anything but i feel like at least the church community i came from came from um there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of people so much focused on survival like i would say a majority of the congregation is definitely low income um the church i grew up in is like mostly majority like filipino church um And I think that there's a lot of, like, actions that are fear-based, and I think that motivates behaviors in a negative way. Um, And I forgot where I was going with this. But basically, I I think whenever I would try to do positive things in that church or, like, start a movement or do something I felt like I really cared about, it wasn't really validated or acknowledged as an important thing. Like, what was highlighted was, like, um, making people fishers of men, quote-unquote, and just, like, getting more people to convert and, like, join the church, Um, which I think is good. Like, it's good to build community, but then it's, like, what is the purpose of that community? Like, in my mind, a huge purpose of the community should be focusing on things like climate action and and indigenous sovereignty land back those things that i find are extremely important but they they would say oh yes those things are important and then there's no action so it's like without action like these things are dead like that faith those ideas are dead you need the action part of it um i remember i hit up my old pastor because um, SCM was like hosting the this um, decolonizing scripture like Bible study kind of thing um, and I was like hey I want to offer it to the youth group because I think this could be really helpful especially with the news coming up about res- residential schools like I think the church should be talking about this um, and his response to that was like um, yeah like what happened was horrible it, like those Christians quote unquote Christians were definitely like a wolf in sheep's clothing blah blah blah, blah. and we are going to work super hard to like make sure that you know we know what's going on and I was like okay but like they, I knew that like when I was reading I was like those are dead words like you guys aren't going to do anything y'all aren't going to change nothing nothing's going to be different um yeah, so that was a big moment where I really was just like, no, I'm done. I'm done with this. Yeah, like, yeah, that that's it. That that's that's a really disappointing response, uh, especially like myself being indigenous, um, and like, yeah, my dad being part of the '60s scoop, uh, and us being like Blackfoot Métis, uh, from Saskatchewan. Like the the, the Cowessis, uh mass grave was was absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but yeah, if you parallel that with like the United Church, the United Church has like they participated in the residential schools uh, at a certain time in a much more limited way, but they still very much own that fact, and they're actively working to reconcile it through many different initiatives and programs. And we even support multi faith uh, with Indigenous support there as well and we have multiple like indigenous support groups uh and we fund indigenous uh help initiatives in our communities and it's just like we're actively trying to trying to fix the mistake that was done and then other people just being like oh well they weren't real christians so it doesn't matter it's like well you know it's like we could be related to some of them right it's like we could be you know in some of the same buildings potentially that some of these people uh 
were in when they were doing these things. And it's just, it doesn't matter if they were fake Christians or not. They still use the name, like, and, and we still have to work to make it right. Yeah. Take accountability. And, like, that makes me angry. Like, um, they distance themselves. They don't want to acknowledge um, what happened or what, like, your fellow, honestly, your fellow Christians. Like, you can say, oh, those are not real Christians, like, all you want. But one thing I learned in Chris Zykman's class um, is that, like, so many different types of people have called themselves Christian over such a long period of time with such varying beliefs. It's like, okay, but who are you to, to, to say that? Like, I could say that about you, like, because you guys don't do X, Y, Z. You guys aren't real mm-hmm. Christians. Like, now what? Like, what does that really even do? Like, that write-off? Um, exactly. Yeah. I guess talking more about SEM and, and the great work that we do at SEM. Um, self-promotion. <laughs> when you said the great work we do, I was like, oh, man. Yeah. We're um, up yeah, as, as soon as the as soon as the words uh, exited my mouth, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, so what are you most looking forward to doing after the restrictions have been lifted and we can have like more in-person events and stuff? So like what with the SEM would you be most looking forward to doing? Um, I have two different like opposing feelings. One is excitement and one is fear. Um the excitement is like just the other day I was looking through some old archives and th- this archive was not that old. This one was from like 2009. Um, and there was this like climate thing they were doing. I forgot what they called it. They called it a sound something, a soundscape. I'm not sure what they called it. Basically it was these SEM members walking through downtown. Um, they walked into, I think one was a bank. Like they walked into these like significant buildings that were like investing into negative um, investing into corporations that were having negative up- impacts and effects on the climate. And they're just like banging pots, making noise. Security came up to them and it was like, Hey, like y'all obviously can't be here. You gotta leave. And they're just like doing their thing. And I was like, wow, these people have no shame. And they're just like doing what they think is right. Um, and in a real, like taking up real world space is something that SEM hasn't been able to do for the last two years like we've had digital um campaigns and uh petitions and digital talks and all these things but we haven't been able to like take up a physical space together and i'm really excited for that to happen because i feel like there's so much more possibilities um and things that can happen so i'm just really excited for just baseline for SEMers to like get in a room together like i'm thinking of there's uh, me and uh, uh, one of the board members and the ex Ryerson um, SEM member want to go to Kingston because there are two SEM members there in Kingston that we've been friends for since I started with SEM, but we've never met in person. Um, so for us, actually, share physical space would be really cool. And I'm fearful because I'm uh, think I think I'm thinking of in my uh, new student. Like, I just graduated, and now I have this job, and I feel a little unqualified, and, um, like, that fearful voice that I have to, like, shut down a lot of the time is saying, like, you you haven't run in-person groups. Like, when I got the SCM job, we were just heading into the pandemic. I have never been in an SCM position in in the quote-unquote real world where the pandemic and these restrictions weren't a thing. So the fear-based part of me is like, hey, you don't know how to do that stuff. Um, and then I just have to tell myself like, yeah, but you'll learn just like you did with everything else and it'll be totally fine. Um, and it's not like you're in it alone. Like so many SCMers that have experience with running these groups are still around and they will help you. Um, so yeah, those are two, my two reactions to that question. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that like the idea of hosting in-person events, potentially even in the fall, uh, at U of T is absolutely terrifying because you know i i haven't even been to my own campus yet because i started this term uh, or i i started my my academic career at u of t during the pandemic right so yeah there's just been no chance whatsoever and yeah it, it is a really terrifying feeling but i mean i i've thrown 
uh, events and, you know, organized and planned different types of events and educational seminars, uh, like in my old position at Trent Spiritual Affairs for my last two years of my undergrad. I was uh, working with them and doing a lot of uh, programming. And, you know, it's it's definitely something that I can say from that was like that fear of not doing a good job when you're throwing and or or you know organizing or hosting an event um it doesn't go away <laughs> it just kind of keeps like staying and you're it's it's just an overwhelming anxiety like until it's over but once it's over the like it's just such a good feeling it's just like it's it's just instant relief and that can help carry you to like organizing the next event so as long as you get that past that first one, the next ones are just so much easier. You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, the feeling I get when walking the dog that I'm sitting right now, where it's like, because he pulls and he's very like energetic, it's like the beginning of it is like, oh my gosh, like, you know, there's a little bit of anxiety, but you got to hype yourself up like, no, I can do this. You got to take control. And then as you first go into it, it's like you're very highly sensitive to what disasters could take place but then you know you kind of settle into it a little bit and as you keep going the energy is like draining out of you which is definitely what I felt when organizing certain like fundraisers or events or um, series or whatever and then by the end of it you're just like oh it's over like it's done and you're extremely tired and you rest and then you do another one (laughs) and it just keeps going yeah Oh man, yeah, that was that was like uh, Zuko every every two hours when we were still like, you know, house training him. Just every two hours, just having to go out, and then at a certain point, he was like, we we couldn't have him uh, off leash, like in the backyard, because like our backyard wasn't fenced in. So like he would start like exploring more and stuff. Uh, then we had to get the leash, and then that was the start of leash training. And oh boy, that was. That that was not fun, just like all all it's the pulling fun. and and the craziness and all the joy of having a three month old puppy. It was yeah, it was a lot of work, but you know, you get you get the relief afterwards, and that carries you over to the next one. The anxiety begins, yeah. builds relief. It's a nice little cycle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but anywho, um, so. That's what you're looking forward to most with SEM, but I guess uh, with restrictions being lifted, people being vaccinated, all that good, good stuff, what are you most excited for personally? Ooh, solid question. I have a clear answer, but it might be a controversial answer um, because I decided I was going to take a solo trip to see this band that I really, really love because they announced that they were performing. And I was like, oh my gosh, are they coming to Toronto? Yes. And they're not coming to Toronto, but they're going to New York. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never traveled on my own. I could go to New York for, by myself for a weekend, see this concert and come back. Like, that'd be so amazing. Um, and then as I was looking into it, I saw that um, you no longer need to quarantine for 14 days if you have the vaccine, if you're double vaxxed, which I am, thankfully. Um And all these things were aligning where it was like, yes, do it. Like, you need this. Like, I need I need something to like keep me hanging on like for the next like three months. Um, And then I start reading these, these news articles now of like, Oh, cases are climbing again. And there's a Delta variant and all these other things. I'm like, Oh my gosh, is there never an end? Like I I have a feeling that like, and I've seen like people in the U S in Ontario, masks are required like everywhere. But, um, our, our SCM friend who's over in Vancouver right now was saying that it's not required. It's just recommended. And there's a lot of people who are like, Oh, recommended. Nah. And they just don't wear masks. Just <laughs> um, stressful. and then same in the U S I know. And same in the U S like a lot of places in the U S now, I think are, it's not, requ- it's not required to wear a mask. And I think people are thinking that things are like okay and they're kind of tired of it so they just they let go and they're like okay i i have this false illusion of safety now um which i really hope stops because i really need the cases to go down so i can go to new york because i've been so safe i don't go out you know i'm double vax or a mask all the time i hardly see people in person like i do all the things um so when this stuff happens it's super frustrating um but yeah i really hope i can go on that trip that's like 
I need that. It's the one thing I'm looking forward to. Yeah, for sure. I um I was I was hoping to go to a concert at the end of the month um at the Phoenix Concert Theater in here in Toronto, especially cuz I'm like still kind of riding that high from uh the COVID immunity after having COVID. Um yeah. so yeah. Uh so yeah, they say like you you're like immune for for 90 days. Uh you can't like transmit or react to the the virus or whatever so yeah just full immunity over here i guess uh and then also i'm double vaxxed now so um yeah i I was really hoping for but they they sold out really quickly they were selling their tickets for like nine dollars and yeah they were uh yeah it's like they have like little tables and stuff uh so it's like groups of two so i was gonna like go with my partner and then we were looking and the only thing they had left was like these giant tables of six and you have to like get tickets for all the seats for for safety so you don't like mix households or whatever yeah so it's like yeah didn't didn't work out but hopefully there will be more concerts soon yeah that's what i tell myself too is like if not if this doesn't work out like if it all goes to hell And it just doesn't work out. There's going to be another one in the future. I just got to keep holding on and finding the little joys, like wherever I can get them, the safe little joys. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I mean, at least tattoo shops are open. Yeah. Ooh, I didn't show you my, I have a new tattoo. Oh yeah, the bird, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's dope. (laughs) Thanks. It's based off of a portrait of Frida Kahlo. That is very meaningful. Yeah, Yeah, that is dope. Um, that's all for my questions. Do you have any more for me or? Hmm. I don't think so. I feel like I'm excited. I'm just excited in general to keep doing these podcast episodes together, both with each other, with our friends, with whatever guests we have and for like our future working relationship, because you're a cool person. I know I'm a cool person, obviously for you all can't see me, but I'm flipping my invisible hair that I don't have. Um, (laughs) And yeah, I'm just excited to keep working together and getting to know each other. And you have a really valuable skill set that I admire and I'm happy to have you around. Yes, I I have a very valuable skill set for a podcast, (laughs) which is in I know how to edit a podcast. (laughs) That's why our sound quality and everything is going to be so much better from here on out. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really looking forward to, to working more with you, too, and to keep doing this podcast. Uh, you know, we're going to be hopefully doing some really interesting topics soon. I know that, like, next month we have uh, the theology of money coming up, I believe, and uh, we've got some other ideas coming in. However, we are also open to any ideas to the listeners. Um, if you have any recommendations, uh, reach out. Uh, for podcast ideas uh, even if you want to maybe even recommend someone to interview uh, you could do that probably on twitter and facebook tweeting at yes, SEM canada we and instagram, instagram. Yeah. yes SEM canada yeah yeah so tweet or instagram or facebook SEM canada if you have any ideas for spirits rising yay thanks so much for listening y'all Thank you for listening to this episode of Spirits Rising. You can listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting apps. Our thanks to the Student Christian Movement for supporting this project, and especially to the SEM York's partnership with St. Theodore of Canterbury Anglican Church and the Diocese of Toronto's REACH Grant.